Um, I'm thrilled that we're able to host Trinisa Mawani as our spring distinguished lecturer. Support for this event came from the Native Immigrant Refugee Crossings Research Initiative of the Center for Race and Gender, which I direct with my colleague Beth Piatote, with funds from the Peter Sather Center, Social Science Matrix, Critical Refugee Studies, HIFES, and Interdisciplinary International Studies, which have all been critical to this project. Um, I also want to acknowledge our many co-sponsors for this event, um, signs of Renisa Mawani's wide-ranging appeal, the Townsend Center for the Humanities, Critical Theory, the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative, Native American Studies, the Institute for South Asian Studies, Law and Contemporary Theory, Canadian Studies, and the Center for the Study of Law and Society. Renisa Mawani is professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of British Columbia and recurring chair of the Law and Society program at the University of British Columbia. Other affiliations at UBC include faculty associate at the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, the Institute for Race, Gender, Sexuality, and Social Justice, Green College, and the Science and Technology Studies program. She works in the fields of critical theory and colonial legal history and has published award-winning scholarship on law, colonialism, and legal geography. Her first book, Colonial Proximities, in 2009, details a set of legal encounters between indigenous peoples, Chinese migrants, mixed race populations, and Europeans in late 19th and early 20th century British Columbia centered around four cases, cross-racial encounters in canneries, so-called white slavery, liquor traffic, and the legal, legal governance of the so-called half-breed. This is a text engaging in the very difficult work of comparative racialization, simultaneously positioning the racialization of these communities in relationship to one another um, in scholarship that is also deeply informed by critical theory to great effect. Her second book, which she's gonna talk about today, Across Oceans of Law, 2018 Duke University Press, is a global and maritime legal history of the Kamagatu Maru that to quote one reviewer, takes us on a journey in a work that is beautifully conceived, deeply researched, and elegantly argued, a book that all of us should read. We have it for sale, courtesy of East Wind Books, if you do not already have your personal copy. And I understand that Renisa is happy to sign uh, your copy. Um, it is impossible to overstate the important interventions made by Renisa in Oceans of Law. The book turns our attention from land and territory to oceans and shows how that approach and this particular story shifts our thinking about so many things, colonialism, legal history, migration, indigeneity, indenture, slavery, empire, and the very concept of time. This is a tremendously erudite, original, and brilliant text. It is very humbling to read it in what it tells us about this person's knowledge, creativity, and dedicated labor. Um, Renisa has produced these two magnificent books, but is also the author and editor of so much more. Just to name a few things to look for, uh, she's co-editor of The Travels of Law, Indian Ocean Itineraries, published in the Law and History Review, co-editor of Unmooring the Kamagatu Maru, 2019, co-editor of the forthcoming Animalia, an anti-imperial bestiary of our times, as well as so many um, other texts, like it's just pages and pages, and I can't um, talk about them right now. Um, a quick announcement about another sign of the deserved level of attention given to the scholar and her work. She had to beg off giving more than two talks here at UC Berkeley this week, but she is giving two, and so she's also speaking tomorrow to the Law and History Workshop, organized by David Lieberman, among others, um, from 12.15 to 2 in 12.29 Dwinnell Hall, so you may also hear more from her there. So I'm thrilled to welcome Renisa Milani. Thank you so much, Letty, for that wonderful in, uh, introduction um, and for the invitation to come to, uh, to Berkeley. And um, I'd also especially like to thank uh, Pam Matsuoka for coordinating my visit uh, and making everything run so smoothly. Um, so I want to just start by saying that um, that 
Many Maori activists uh, remind us that what happened in New Zealand uh, is not new, right? That this is actually preceded by hundreds of years of violence directed at uh, the Maori people. Um, and much of my work in colonial proximities and also in Across Oceans of Law has really been trying to map these um, historical and geographical relations. Um, so the, the talk that I'm giving today is uh, draws from the first chapter of the book, Across Oceans of Law, uh, which Letty showed you, but I'm going to put up here because uh, Duke makes really nice books. Um, and it traces the transoceanic movements of the Komagatamaru, a British-built and Japanese-owned steamship. So the vessel was built in 1890 for the German Hansa Line under the name SS Steubenhock. And it was sold in 1892 and then renamed in 1894 as the Sicilia. And you can even see sort of changes in the ship itself. And from 1890 to 1913, the vessel carried European travelers and settlers from German and later Mediterranean ports to Montreal, New York City, and to other former slave ports along the Atlantic coast. Um, and this map, which uh, I'm not sure if you can see very clearly, shows you the different voyages of this one ship in its three lives as the Stupenhook, the Sicilia, and the Komagatamaru. So in the first two decades at sea, the vessel crisscrossed the North Atlantic, connecting the so-called old world to the new. But it wasn't actually until the first decades of the 20th century that the ship became of interest to Canada, the US, and the British Empire. In 1914, Gurdit Singh, a 56-year-old rubber planter and a railway contractor from Punjab and a long-term resident of Malaya and Singapore, successfully chartered the steamer after many um, unsuccessful attempts. And this was part of a much larger plan to begin the Grunanic Steamship Company, uh, an autonomous shipping firm which was to transport passengers and cargo from Calcutta to Vancouver and from Bombay to Brazil. The Komagatamaru and his um, grand vision was to be the first ship of four and the voyage from Hong Kong to Vancouver was to be its maiden voyage. Um, in an unprecedented journey, Singh transported 376 Punjabi migrants across the Pacific. Uh, the passengers were mostly Sikh, some were Hindu, and 25 were Muslim. Two were women, and three were children, including his son, Balwant, his six-year-old son, Balwant, whom I'll show you later on. Um, and this is a map that shows the outbound voyage from Hong Kong, stopping in uh, Shanghai, Moji, Yokohama, uh, to Vancouver and then its outbound journey back to Calcutta where it was deported two months after it arrived in, in Vancouver Harbor. So Singh was an entrepreneur, but he had no experience in shipping, which I find so remarkable that he would charter this vessel and uh, take a chance to cross the Pacific. Like many of his contemporaries, he insisted on a legal right to travel throughout the British Empire. Um, so in some ways, his aspirations were not really unusual. Many uh, Punjabi migrants, many Indian migrants at the time were making similar claims, making arguments that they were British subjects and that they should be able to travel where they liked across the British Empire. Um, but by chartering a ship and commanding its Trans-Pacific Passage, he asserted an unparalleled legal and political claim to the sea. So despite being British subjects, the passengers were detained in Vancouver for two months with short supplies of food and water, um, and all but 20 were deported to Calcutta. So the 20 who could prove pre previous domicile were allowed to land, the rest were sent to Calcutta. And when the ship arrived on the Hooghly River, the Bengal police and the Indian military confronted the passengers even before they disembarked. So a new um, uh, ordinance had been passed by the Indian colonial government and the district magistrate actually boarded the ship and read the ordinance out to the passengers, telling them that unless they followed orders, they would be arrested and detained without charge. Uh, many of the passengers uh, refused to, uh, to do as they were told and to board these special trains to uh, Punjab. And in a violent conflict, 40 people were killed, including 19 passengers. Uh, many more injured and more than 200 passengers were detained without charge under this new ordinance in the Alipur Central Jail in Calcutta. Um, 
So this is all I'm going to tell you about the voyage of the ship itself. What I'd like to do today is to sort of give you a sense of what the um, kind of more conceptual arguments are around uh, the freedom of the sea and why I think it might be useful to think about this particular event um, as a maritime event as opposed to a story of uh, Canadian immigration law. So the voyage of the Kamagatamaru has received considerable scholarly attention in Canada and more recently in India. And interest in the ship has only expanded following the 100 year centenary celebration. So many people in outside of Punjab haven't actually heard of this event, uh, but there's been a considerable amount of work done by um, Punjabi scholars and activists and artists in order to sort of uh, um, to educate a wider Indian uh, audience. Um, so since May 2014, there have been several books published and numerous articles, uh, including my own. Um, yet much of this work, with few notable exceptions, situates the ship within Can Canadian immigration law, describing its detention and deportation as an apogee of, Canadian, of Canada's long ongoing legal history of racism directed at uh, Chinese and Japanese migrants in particular. And as important as this argument is, it obscures other histories, including those of ocean worlds. So when I began working on this project a very long time ago, I kept asking myself why this ship, which was British built and Japanese owned, chartered by a Punjabi who lived in Malaya and Singapore, and which voyaged across the Pacific and Indian Oceans could be so easily claimed as a moment in Canadian history. What was missing? What were we overlooking by claiming this as, um, you know, as a as a dark moment in Canadian history, as many people call it? So, in Across Oceans of Law, I take a different tack. I ask, what is at stake historically and conceptually when Indian migration is situated in maritime worlds? Um, so in the book, I consider how immigration restrictions and Indian radicalism take on different contours when the ship and the sea are foregrounded and analyzed as key juridical formations. So how might a shift from land to sea open additional vantage points from which to examine changing itineraries of British and colonial law and anti-colonial contest? And what, in what ways does um, a maritime view of Indian travel and migration invite a wider and more capacious geography to track racial, legal, and polit political struggles over mobility, movement, and imperial control. And perhaps most importantly, in what ways might, might we unravel the relationships between different histories of colonial displacement, so forced migration, indigenous dispossession, and transatlantic slavery. So what really interests me is how is it how might one follow a ship through these different ocean regions and think about uh, the intersecting and overlapping geographies and histories that these ocean regions um, convey? So to be clear, the Komagatamaru was not the only ship to carry Indian migrants to Canada's west coast. Many ships preceded it. But what made its arrival and detention so spectacular was that it was the only ship to be chartered and commanded by an uh, an Indian subject, and the first to be successfully turned away from um, Canadian waters. And so many people, including Radhika Mongia, have pointed out the ways in which this particular event had a dramatic effect on uh, nationalizing borders, so through the um, introduction of the passport, um, and through uh, much more um, sort of um, a more careful sort of regulation of bodies and space. In the first decade of the 20th century, Dominion authorities received several unsubstantiated reports of Indian men suspected of chartering ships and transporting their countrymen from the subcontinent to Canada. And these speculations, I argue, spawned two interrelated concerns. The first centered on fears of an unprecedented and unbridled mobility of Indian migrants, newly asserting their rights as British subjects. And this is a narrative that's more familiar. The second revitalized debates on the freedom of the sea. So with the, with the age of steam, rates of outbound migration from India increased and extended further into the Pacific. And in response, the white dominions, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, introduced new forms of maritime surveillance, including restrictions and prohibitions on mobility. These contests over transoceanic travel created a renewed interest in the racial and legal status of the sea, where they open or closed and for whom. 
And it's the free sea, a legal concept that was born in the Indian Ocean, that is really the main focus of my paper today. So I'm going to sort of uh, just give you a brief uh, introduction of the kind of, uh, of my interlocutors, and then I'll move into uh, elaborating. So European maritime empires, including the Portuguese, Dutch, and British, engaged in lively debate on the racial and legal status of the high sea. The law of the sea, Ram Prakash Anand writes, developed in response to the needs of European industrial powers for wider markets in Asia and Africa. Centuries before, indigenous people were already engaged in free navigation and trade in the Indian Ocean. The publication of Hugo Grotius's Mir Liberum in 1609 afforded these deliberations a newfound significance. Here, the Dutch jurist concluded that the high sea was the free sea, a common space that was beyond national and imperial claims to sovereignty. In drawing this conclusion, Grotius imposed an elemental and juridical distinction between land and sea, a divide that has since featured prominently in European thought, visibly evidenced in maps of world regions, and as the basis of international law. But not dis notwithstanding its designation as free, the high seas from Grotius onward were highly regulated and judiciously policed. Indeed, Britain's ascendancy as a maritime empire was achieved through a juridification of the sea, advanced through legislation, treaties, agreements, and in legal restrictions imposed on ships, passengers, and cargo. So this, this firm land free sea divide that locates oceans as international spaces beyond imperial sovereignty and outside the nation state is not a natural elemental or objective dividing line. It's been historically produced in Europe and later American imperial interests and in ways that demand further analysis well into the current global order. And I'm thinking specifically to the migrant deaths on the Mediterranean and the debates around how free or closed the seas are, and also in the South Pacific in the offshore detention facilities in Australia. The free sea, I am suggesting, was not only a European creation, which is an argument that has been, that is well known uh, and has been um, articulated by scholars of international law, but one that inaugurated the basis of a new world order um, in, and a new world order that's evidenced in international law, but also in the ways in which maps of uh, the world are drawn. But the Free Sea has always been a site of anti-colonial contests waged by indigenous people, African captives, and Indian migrants, including Gurdit Singh and his collaborator, Hussein Rahim. So actors who refused to abide by European legal, racial, and political dominance over the high seas. And before I turn to the disputed chronology of the Free Sea, I want to, so I, I will talk more about Grotius and also about Carl Schmidt. But before that, I want to say something about Hussein Rahim, who's the main protagonist of my talk today. So in the first decade of the 20th century, one of the most significant challenges to Canadian immigration legislation came not from Gurdit Singh, but from Hussein Rahim. After arriving in Vancouver in 1909, Rahim quickly rose to prominence as the leader of the Shore Committee, and the Shore Committee was comprised of uh, mostly Punjabi Sikh men, but not exclusively, um, who <coughs> raised funds to assist Gurdit Singh and the passengers on the Komagatamaru to secure landing in Vancouver. And though Rahim and his counterparts raised nearly $70,000 in 1914 um, of cash and of property and eventually assumed the Komagatamaru's charter, their plans to uh, ensure that the passengers landed was unsuccessful. The vessel was not allowed to land in Vancouver. It was barred entry through three orders in council, one that required all Asian migrants <coughs> to have $200 in their possession, another disallowing laborers to enter British Columbia, and the third requiring all travelers to make a continuous journey from their place of birth or naturalization. And as you saw from the previous map, the, the Komagatamaru did not make a continuous journey. So Rahim was deeply, deeply sympathetic to the legal restrictions that confronted the passengers upon their arrival. Described as an adventurer by Indian authorities, his own journey from India to Canada did not follow a smooth, continuous, or direct route. He left uh, India in 1895, 10 years after Gurdit Singh. He lived in Kobe for a decade under the Hindu name of Changan Viraj Varma. And given his supposedly great capacity for business, particularly his experience in the cotton trade, Rahim was recruited as a working partner in the newly established firm owned by Jamshedi Manekji Nanporia, a Bombay Parsi. 
Seven years later, when Nanporia returned briefly to Bombay, Rahim allegedly made a huge speculative business, according to authorities, and incurred heavy responsibilities. He paid up the firm's dues and left Japan under the Muslim name of H. Rahim, partly to avoid Jamshedi and partly to avoid further prosecution. So Rahim left Kobe for Hawaii, and on December 1909, after residing in Honolulu for nearly two years, he boarded, he boarded the SS Moana, a steamer run by the Australia Steamship Company, which stopped briefly in Honolulu on its regular route from Sydney to Vancouver. And interestingly, uh, Moana means open ocean in Hawaiian. So reports of Rahim's alleged, uh, alleged fraudulent business practices combined with his mutable religious identities and his multiple aliases created suspicion amongst authorities in India, Canada, and the US. Um, so William Hopkinson, the, Dominion, the Dominion's immigration inspector um, in Vancouver, who assumed a key role in the Komagatmur's detention and deportation and was eventually assassinated for his involvement, wrote, there's been a certain amount of distrust in the Hindu colony with respect to Rahim. No one has yet been able to ascertain his village address in India, and many suspect that he is not a Mohammedan, as he claims, but is a Hindu and comes from the province of Bombay. Rahim's arrival to Vancouver would only incite further speculation. Was he Hindu or Muslim? Did he come from Bombay, Delhi, or elsewhere? By some accounts, he was considered to be a revolutionary from Bengal. By others, he was a merchant from a village in Gujarat, a province located in the northwest part of India, non known for its long history of shipping and piracy, um, and of course, the birthplace of Gandhi. According to the superintendent of Bombay police, Rahim's given name was Changan Karaj Verma, though many knew him as Changan Lal. He was a 46-year-old Hindu from the Lohana Banya caste and a native of, of the Porbandar state in Kathiawar, Gujarat. Um, and many Ismailis, a small sect of Shiite Muslims, claim that Rahim, uh, still to this day, that Rahim was the first Ismaili to uh, arrive in uh, North America. So there's still a lot of dispute about who he is and who he represents. Um, when Rahim left Kobe for Hawaii, he carried with him a large sum of money, which he allegedly stole from Nanporia's firm. In Honolulu, he became the owner of considerable property. But after arriving on Canada's west coast, Rahim's commercial interests quickly turned political. The struggles he waged on behalf of Indians, those already in British Columbia and those not yet arrived, would hold far-reaching consequences. Rahim's determination to challenge racial rule on Canada's west coast would radically alter the fate of the Komagatamaru passengers and the future of hundreds seeking passage from Punjab to the Pacific littoral. And I'll, re, uh, I'll return to Rahim shortly, but I want to say something now about the European legal history of the Free Sea and its reconfiguration of the earth, as well as its significance for a study on Indian migration. So European debates on the legal status of the high seas and international law did not originate in Europe, um, and they also didn't originate in colonial uh, in, on colonial land. Rather, they grew from European struggles over trade and commerce and maritime control in colonial contexts, Southeast Asia and the so-called New World, depending on which thinkers and histories we follow. It's important to keep in mind that these debates, whether in the Pacific, Atlantic, or Indian Oceans, displaced indigenous cosmologies, communities, and commercial practices surrounding ocean spaces. So in the Indian Ocean, for example, indigenous rulers and subaltern mariners viewed the sea as open and free for all. Uh, commerce was, uh, the sea was considered to be a common space. Uh, no one made sort of legal or uh, claims to oceans. And this was not actually challenged until the end of the 15th century when the Portuguese arrived in Asia. Yet the free sea is a term most commonly traced to the writings of Dutch jurist and humanist Hugo Grotius. In his early 20s at the time, Grotius was commissioned by the Dutch East India Company to consider a maritime contest that would have far-reaching historical, political, and legal consequences. Could oceans like land be subject to proprietary claims, or were the seas to be held in common to all? Importantly, these questions emerged from the capture of a ship in the midst of international conflicts over trade and control in the states, in the Strait of Malacca. And this is a well-known event, but one that bears repeating here only, if only to emphasize the inherent contradictions of the doctrine of the free sea. 
So on February 25th, 1603, three Dutch vessels surrounded and attacked the Santa Catarina, a Portuguese carrack. The vessel, which was traveling from Macau to Goa and a larger fleet of ships, carried a high value cargo of silks, cottons, porcelain, ornate wood carvings, and gold. Jacob von Heemskerk, the commander of the Dutch fleet, was not formally authorized to attack the Carrick, either by the company that employed him or by the VOC, but he did so opportunistically and on his own accord. And when the case arrived in Amsterdam's Admiralty Court, the question was whether the seizure was legal or illegal, whether it was privateering or piracy. And Grotius was asked to, to uh, reflect on this. His response to the Santa Catarina was published in 1609 under the title Mare Liberum or Free Sea. And given the ongoing efforts by the Portuguese in the East Indies, which were aimed at obstructing Dutch trade, Grotius concluded that Van Heemskerk's seizure of the Santa Catarina was legal and legitimate in a time of war. Grotius's writings on the Free Sea would become a founding text in the history of, of international law. And although he focused explicitly on the Hollanders' right to oceanic trade and commerce, Mare Liberum was received by European jurists to be a critical reflection on the legal standing of the high sea, one that's centered on questions of imperium and jurisdiction and dominium property. And it was especially contentious among British jurists who feared Dutch encroachment in British waters. So William Wellwood and John Selden made the counterclaim of Mare Clausum or the closed sea. The conventional readings of Mare Liberum have uh, emphasized Grotius's thinking on natural law and the law of nations. By most accounts, Grotius is placed along two other founding fathers of international law, Francisco de Vitoria and Alberico Gentili. Grotius's writings, some contend, were intended as a treatise on global commerce and not a reflection on the high seas, but we might see the two as inseparable, uh, that commerce and the status of the sea are uh, overlapping. The freedom of the sea w was a freedom for European powers that sought to curtail trade and commerce along Malays, Indians, and other Asian mariners in the region. And in the book, I read Mare Liberum as an aesthetic meditation on the high seas that had far-reaching implications for uh, the legal order and orientation of the earth. And for Grotius, it was really the, the physical material properties of oceans, their expansiveness and ceaseless change that rendered them to be elementally and jur juridically distinct from land. So the high seas were vital to Europe's aspirations to colonize and resettle the earth. Seagoing ships opened European access westward and eastward to the appropriation of indig indigenous lands, waterways, natural resources, and to the transport of slaves through what many term free trade. But oceans were also maritime highways that needed to be crossed in order to reach Asia, Asian emporia from Europe. Oceans were key to furnishing European powers with land, labor, and commodity. And these ocean histories are often forgotten in discussions of cellar colonialism. So in advancing his arguments on the Hollanders' right to commerce, Grotius drew a fundamental and irreconcilable distinction between land and sea. It was their elemental differences and physical material properties that he argued that determined legal matters of occupation and possession. Whereas land was solid and could easily be divided, ocean owned and occupied, the sea was liquid, ephemeral, and expansive. Um, and he says, unlike parts of the earth that do not cohere and are already partitioned, all the sea properly so-called coheres and is one and continuous. Therefore, the limit of lands is in the air and the sea. The limit of the entire sea is only in the air. By conceiving of oceans as actual but limitless spaces, Grotius offered an alternative view of the earth that repositioned maritime worlds and recast conceptions of imperial sovereignty and control. Land, islands, sand, and rock did not physically limit the sea, he argued, but were limited by it. The sea was more comparable to the ephemerality of other earthly substances, including air, than it was to the solidity and immovability of land. If air and sea were analogous and comparable, Grotius reasoned, then the element of the sea is common to all, so infinite that it cannot be possessed and applied to all uses, whether we respect navigation or fishing. So Grotius is really focused on the Indian Ocean world. He's interested in, he sees it as peopled, he sees it as a region that is filled with Asian mariners and with uh, um, indigenous sovereigns. Um, and he's really concerned with, uh, and, and by centering the sea, he comes up with a very different sort of legal geography. 
as Europe's coordinations and con concentrations of maritime power shifted and expanded, and as Britain gained ascendancy as an empire of the sea um, in later uh, time, oceans remained politically charged sites of imperial contest. Um, and so although the uh, British, in response to Grotius made the argument, British jurists made the argument that the sea was closed, what we see is a kind of oscillation between the open and closed sea, um, which um, David Armitage argues is one of the greatest ideological foundations of the British Empire. So in the 18th century and in response to Grotius, Britain is advancing arguments for a closed sea. By the 19th century, Britain endorsed the freedom of the sea, yet the free sea was subject to increased regulation, including colonial and racial surveillance. And although the empire supported and benefited from the supposed freedom of oceanic commerce, most evidenced in the transatlantic slave trade and in the circulation of, of plantation commodities, it sought to control the high sea in a, seas in a number of ways, through navigation acts, treaties, maritime law, and through the movement of ships. Uh, the movement of British ships fortified a new era marked by Britannia's efforts to rule the waves. So this elemental and juridical distinction between land and sea that featured so prominently in Grotius' thinking was reinscribed and fortified through other maritime orders. By the 18th century, the fluctuating status of the open and closed sea was assuaged through the inscription of new global lines that were territorial, temporal, and racial, um, and to which the movement of ships remained crucial. So in the larger chapter in the book, um, I do this in more detail, and uh, doing so requires a historical and geographical shift from Grotius, Southeast Asia, and the VOC to the German nationalist Carl Schmidt, who wrote critically of the New World and especially the British Empire. But contrary to Schmidt's claims regarding the significance of firm land in juridical and global orders, the fluvial world of the ship, I contend, inaugurated a nomos of the earth that was centered not on firm land, but on free sea. And it was as spatial as it was temporal. So what I do in the, um, before I talk about Schmidt, what I do in the book is to think about these sort of competing chronologies of the free sea, how they're working um, at different moments, and also trying to think about uh, Grotius's centering of the sea and Schmidt's centering of land and where that takes them. So the land-sea divide that Grotius outlined in Mare Liberum resurfaced in the mid-20th century in the writings of, Sch of Carl Schmidt. A Nazi sympathizer and collaborator, Schmidt was known as a crown jurist of the Third Reich and for good reason. His ideas were widely circulated and have gained new pro newfound prominence today. Though he was a deep admirer and advocate of European global supremacy, and he talked about the shift from uh, sea to air, for example, he was also very critical of the British Empire, a view that often places him in strange company. So many of Schmidt's arguments, Antony Engie point, points out, bear a striking resemblance to, to the arguments made by post-colonial and third world scholars regarding the character and geopolitics of international law. Schmidt's political and legal thought offers important reflections and competing chronologies of changing imperial orders. So Grotius and Schmidt may share a common vernacular in which the free sea figures prominently, but they use this concept distinctly and to different ends. So the seizure of the Santa Catarina occurred in 1603. Mare Liberum was published anonymously in 1609. By some accounts, the inter-imperial conflicts over the freedom of the high seas surfaced much earlier. And indeed, in Carl Schmidt's chronology, struggles over firm land and free sea arose soon after Columbus so-called discovered the Americas. It was in 1492, he argues, that a new <coughs> world actually emerged. From this point onward, Schmidt suggests the earth was no longer what it had been in the physical or metaphysical sense. And I quote, the structure of all traditional concepts of the center and the age of the earth had to change. Global lines were drawn to divide and distribute. The newly discovered parts of the earth and a new world war order was conceived. And of course, Schmidt describes this earthly order very famously as nomos. The Greek term translates as Norman right, but nomos also means to divide and to pasture. So for Schmidt, nomos is a concept that was always already rooted in land. All pre-global orders, he wrote, were essentially terrestrial, even if they encompassed sea powers and thalassocracies. 
it's an interesting point, especially if he argues that 1492 is the emergent, is the sort of key moment, because Columbus's uh, uh, so-called discovery of the Americas was only possible via sea and through developments in navigation. And yet, the nomos of the Earth, in Schmidt's account, remains a concrete spatial order. Although the sea figures in Schmidt's formulation, his emphasis on terra firma forecloses the possibility that the nomos was an oceanic order as it was for Grotius. So from the 15th century onwards, as long distance sea travel became vital to the economic and political success of Europe's competing, became vital to the economic and political success of Europe's competing empires. Just as the Eastern Indian Ocean was crucial to European dominance over trade and control in Southeast Asia, as conflicts of the Santa, over the Santa Catarina suggest, the Atlantic and Pacific were crucial to territorial appropriation, indigenous dispossession, and to the European resettlement of the Americas. People, commodities, ideas, and laws that made territorial appropriation possible in the first place were transported across the seas via ship. Conditions that Grotius and Schmidt acknowledged but not, did not fully explain. Both were concerned in different ways and to different, to different degrees with the ways in which maritime mobility produced new spatial and juridical orders. And it was through ships that each divided the earth into firm land and free sea. But Grotius, I'm arguing, centers the ocean while Schmidt privileges land. In his account of the sea, Schmidt, like Grotius, also highlighted its physical material properties and its differences from terrestrial orders. But for Schmidt, land and sea were not elemental in the scientific sense or in the natural sense. They were materially and legally produced. So for Schmidt, if soil manifests, firm lines through fences, enclosures, and walls. The sea knows no such apparent unity of space and law, of order and orientation. The fields cannot be planted at sea, and firm lands cannot be engraved. Vessels that sail across the sea leave no trace. And one of the points that I make in, in the chapter and in the book is that uh, for Schmidt, the sea is empty, right? There's, it's, there's no people in there, there's nothing in there, um, whereas Grotius really sees it as full, even if he doesn't um, give any sort of uh, autonomy to the um, Asian mariners and sovereigns. But Schmidt does criticize Grotius on a number of accounts, including his failure to address the question of land. Grotius was well aware of Spain's efforts to deterritorialize and eliminate indigenous people in the Americas, Schmidt alleged, yet he said nothing of the European appropriation of non-European territory. Notwithstanding the key differences in their thinking, it's difficult to overlook the resounding echoes in their characterizations of the sea uh, to some extent. So both emphasize the ocean's fluvial properties as key features that distinguish the ever-changing sea from soli the solidity and fixity of land. Whereas Grotius viewed the sea to be peopled, uh, Schmidt sees it as empty. And he argues that land appropriations were at the origin of all juridical orders and were the primeval act in the founding of law. Unlike firm land, which could be parceled, divided, and cultivated, the sea has no character. Character comes from the Greek term meaning to engrave, to scratch, to imprint. But for Schmidt, the open sea has no limits, no boundaries, no consecrated sites, no sacred orientations, no land, no property. On the waves, there is nothing but waves. Another fundamental difference in the free sea, as conceived by Grotius and Schmidt, uh, versus not just sort of uh, empty and full, but is also the role of the ship. So in writing Mare Liberum, Grotius directed his attention to Dutch and Portuguese vessels, beginning with the Santa Catarina, and there's some debate over to what extent he actually did ar uh, archival research in the VOC archives, um, and to what extent he looked at the log books of captains and so on and so forth. So he was very attentive to the plural legalities of maritime worlds, especially their differences from terrestrial orders. The polycentricity of maritime worlds dramatically shamed his, shaped his conceptions of sovereignty. Schmidt, by contrast, really expressed little interest in, sh in ships. Although he wrote briefly and sporadically of seagoing vessels, he was much more concerned with the, with the contrast they posed to house and land. For Schmidt, the antithesis between land, sea, and house ship was also a geographical and civilizational demarcation between east and west. 
whereas East was defined through land, West, embodied first by Europe and then North America, was associated by, with the sea. So Schmidt writes, what we call today the Orient is a contiguous mass of land-based countries, Russia, China, India, and what we call the Occident is the hemisphere surrounded by the great oceans, the Atlantic and Pacific. This division of the earth along elemental, juridical, and civilizational registers coalesced in the existential and legal distinctions between ship and house. And so um, uh, in the planetary, planetary order between East and West, Schmidt writes, the ship or sea vessel lies at the center of man's maritime existence in the same way that the house lays at the center of terrestrial existence. But only one of these, the house, represented a true juridical order. The fundamental institution of law, dominion, or property receives its name from Domus House. If terrestrial life for Schmidt revolves around the house, maritime life revolves around the ship, which one must navigate. In Schmidt's assessment, the ship was not a symbol, expression, or materialization of law as it was for Grotius. If the house was the origin of European property, the ship was merely a technical vehicle, a necessary instrument for man's domination over nature. The distinctions between firm land and free sea that distinguished the terrestrial, the oceanic, the nation state, and international were not rooted in some kind of natural <laughs> elemental order. Despite Grotius and Schmidt's efforts to divide the earth elementally, these divisions were racial and imperial from the very start. And this is one of the arguments that uh, Ram Prakash Anand makes. Notwithstanding the doctrine of the free sea and despite European efforts to monopolize oceanic trade, Asian and indigenous mariners continued to engage in commercial, commercial activities. The arrival of steam in the mid 19th century transformed these contests in new ways. By the turn of the 20th century, as steamship travel became more accessible and affordable, Indian travelers and traders moved beyond the Eastern and Western Indian oceans and began crossing the Pacific in greater numbers. Not huge numbers, by the turn of the century, I think there were about 5,000 um, uh, Indians, mostly Punjabis living in Vancouver. The compressed spatial and temporal distance between England and the colonies combined with greater interoceanic inter travel between Asia and the so-called New World also opened new anti-colonial possibilities, which only resulted in additional regimes of imperial surveillance and racial governance. And what I argue in situating the Komagachmaru within this much longer historical arc, I argue that its landing in Vancouver produced a set of questions on the legal standing of the sea, the racial, territorial, and temporal bounds of imperial jurisdictions, and the rights of British subjects within aqueous and terrestrial spaces. The ship's voyage brought the empire's distinction between land and sea and its territorial ambiguities and temporal asymmetries directly into clear sight. And obviously I can't tell you uh, much about that. Uh, but to give you a sense of what I'm saying, I want to turn again to Hussein Rahim to think about what these contests look like. So in Mare Liberum, Grotius characterized oceans to be common property. If the sea was free and held in common to all, then no one could be, then technically no one could be barred from crossing. And although Grotius recognized the sovereignty of indigenous rulers, particularly the rights to trade and enter treaties with European powers, including the Dutch, he showed little regard for indigenous mobilities. The rights of Indians to travel across the seas did not enter his writings at all. So the subtitle to Mare Liberum reads, the right which belongs to the Dutch to take part in the East Indian trade. And the other English translation is a disputation concerning the right which the Hollanders ought to have to the Indian merchandise for trading. For Grotius, the freedom of the sea was a freedom held by European sovereigns and those they sponsored. It was a freedom to send and command ships in the East Indies. And although India had a long history of maritime trade with Arab and Chinese merchants, one that preceded the arrival of Europeans, the freedom of the seas was not extended to Indians or to other Asiatics. Indians were only present to service the commercial pursuits of the Portuguese, the VOC, and the British Empire. So on the Santa Catarina, for example, uh, there, some of the crew were, um, uh, were from Bengal. 
But, these, but there are alternative genealogies of the free sea. To begin, Chinese, Indian, and Arab seafarers crossed the seas for millennia, trading goods, establishing commercial routes, and big, building social and religious networks and communities along the Indian Ocean arenas. In maritime worlds beyond Europe, the seas were viewed as a common space, a site of movement, mobility, exchange, and connectivity. And this is not to suggest that they were not also sites of violence. Um, but there was a very different conception of what the sea looked like. In 1912, uh, Radha Kumud Mukherjee, a professor of Indian history in Bengal, documented aspects of this maritime trade uh, and maritime history in his widely read Indian Shipping, A History of the Seaborne Trade and Maritime Activity of the Indians from the Earliest Times. He offered the first coherent survey of Indian navigation from earliest times to the end of the Mughal period. And in this very expansive work, he detailed India's rich and illustrious history of maritime commerce, including its influence in the Eastern and Western Indian Ocean regions. The subcontinent ship building technologies were so advanced, Mukherjee claimed, that they drew the attention and admiration of many prominent Europeans, including Marco Polo, as well as other Genu Genoese and Venetian merchants. By the 19th century, however, Britain's ongoing efforts uh, to rule the waves and to maintain its dominance over India held serious consequences for Indian shipping. So Mukherjee writes, India is now without this most important organ of national life. British and European ships newly replaced Indian vessels, which had transported people and cargo across the Indian Ocean for centuries. Our entire passenger traffic is, in the hand, is now in the hands of foreign shippers. But according to Mukherjee and according to others, India could imagine a very different future if they could, uh, if Indians could reclaim the sea. And these were the ambitions of Gurdjieff Singh and Hussein Rahim. So against the sort of growing expansion of European control and sort of reaching back to a longer history of uh, Indian maritime trade, Gurdjieff Singh and Hussein Rahim were both thinking about how the sea might figure in. Um, in pathways to Indian independence. So Rahim arrived on the Moana, um, and his arrival marked the beginning of a series of protracted legal struggles that centered on the seaborne mobility of Indian migrants and their rights to enter Britain's most northerly dominion. Could Indians as British subjects travel freely across the seas that connected Britain's vast empire? So Rahim was, was um, the continuous journey provision was passed after Rahim arrived in Vancouver in 1909, and he was the subject of a legal case in which the uh, authorities, William Hopkinson in particular, tried to apply the continuous journey provision retroactively against Rahim. So he was successful in his case, and in and after that took up the cases of uh, other Indian migrants and became a source of great annoyance to the immigration department, according to one authority. Um, another described him as a leader in the agitation against the immigration laws uh, and someone who assumed a prominent part in stirring up discontent in the Hindu community. And despite questions and uncertainties surrounding his identity, particularly his religious affiliations, and the fact that he worked so closely with Punjabis and with Sikhs, another official described him to be a renegade Muslim. So from 1910 onwards, Rahim waged a series of political battles so that Indians, irrespective of religious uh, irrespective of religious affiliation, would be allowed to enter Canada. He insist that, insisted that women be permitted to land and championed the rights of men to vote in local elections. And here he is in 1913, pictured forth from the left um, after the 39 Hindus case in which the British Columbia Court of Appeal actually struck down the continuous journey provisions. Um, but he would be best known for mobilizing, for his role in mobilizing a political and legal campaign in support of the Kamagatamaru's passengers. His efforts and collaborations generated considerable interest across the British Empire, so the ship's detention and deportation from Vancouver catalyzed a transoceanic and uneven network of anti-colonialism that connected India, Canada, and South Africa to Hong Kong, uniting the subcontinent and diaspora and generating fears of further rebellion and revolution. For Rahim and other members of the Shore Committee, the Kamagatamaru would change their fate and 
fortunes forever. Their efforts to raise funds and to secure the vessel's monthly charter, so the $70,000 that they raised, resulted in a series of financial losses that became the subject of a government investigation, but for which they would never be compensated. And here's Rahim boarding uh, the Komagatamaru. Writing for the Hindustani, an English language paper that, that Rahim founded in 1914, he documented the hardening of borders across land and sea. In three issues published between April and June 1914, he penned a column titled Canada is a Hindu Saad. And here is the June issue of the Hindustani uh, with uh, the iconic photo of Gurdit Singh and his six-year-old son Balwant on the cover. So, the articles, this, this uh, set of articles, Canada as a Hindu saw it, coincided with and were refracted through the Komagatamaru's landing and detention in Vancouver Harbor. Here, Rahim warned his readers of Britannia's expanding efforts to rule the waves. As Asiatics gained new opportunities to travel across the Pacific, Britain and its colonies began imposing additional restrictions. In response, Rahim proposed an alternative cartography of the earth, one that joined land and sea and guided his readers on how best to avoid maritime surveillance. So Rahim uh, reversed the sort of gaze um, from land to sea and looked at, uh, the, at Canada, or looked at Vancouver from sea to land. Um, ocean crossings, he urged, offered Indian migrants and travelers important economic and political opportunities to experience and appreciate the Earth's beauty firsthand. So Rahim strongly encouraged his readers to leave the subcontinent and pursue travel to North America. He advised that the principal uh, connection in this method of seaborne transportation between Asia and America is over the Pacific. Um, and he commended the fact that the CPR white liners, the magnificent Empress boats, have reduced the time it takes to get from Japan to North America and from Hong Kong to British Columbia. And while he saw the Pacific Ocean as, having, as holding great economic and political promise for Indian travelers, Rahim was also aware that uh, the growing steamship traffic between Asia to North America across the Pacific was also, in result, was also resulting in new forms of legal regulation. Um, and part of this was because of the concerns about that authorities had about what was actually happening on these ships and how the sort of cl close proximity between different people from other places in the British Empire might actually result in new anti-colonial struggles. Um, so the interoceanic traffic and merchandise and passengers between Asia and America, Rahim cautioned, was also engaging the attention of the people of the countries lying on both sides of the Pacific Ocean. Authorities in Canada, the US and Britain and India had already initiated legal efforts to expand maritime surveillance in order to curtail the mobility of Indian migrants and other Asiatic travelers as evidenced by the Chinese head tax and the continuous journey law. So Rahim, reflected on the Pacific not as a domain of freedom, but as a space saturated by law and surveillance. And what he advocated his readers to do is to think about traveling across the Atlantic instead of the Pacific Ocean. And in fact, the Pacific was the site of the, uh, was the site, um, the ports of call in which the continuous journey regulation was used. So one of the challenges made against the continuous journey law was that it wasn't actually used on the Atlantic side. It was really aimed specifically at uh, Punjabi and Indian migrants. So Rahim was well aware that there's all these timetables and leaflets and guides and descriptive pan pamphlets um, offered by the steamship and railroad agencies, but that they never actually made it into India because of the collaboration between the colonial government um, and the British Empire in preventing Indians from traveling outward. Um, and he said, the home authorities and colonial government, the government of India has checked all tours and travels of the Hindustani outward from India to Europe, Australia, Canada, South Africa, and America, which cynically claim to be white man's countries. I have to say, this is so chilling in light of what's just happened in New Zealand. Although Indian migrants and travelers continued to leave the subcontinent, upon reaching their destinations, many were confined, confronted by restrictive and prohibitory legislation. 
Raheem's own example, juxtaposed with the fate of the Komagatamaru passengers, vividly demonstrated the expanding registers of racial governance that he was referring to. But he remained steadfast. He said, instead of asking the reader to come from the Pacific to the mainland, I want him to look up to the Atlantic, which connects the American continent with the old world in Africa, the side from which Columbus entered this, enter this hemisphere in 1492. For Rahim, transatlantic voyages held many possibilities, allowing Indians to follow the tracks of European settlers. Rahim was clearly aware of how Europeans had divided the earth through the global lines of latitude, longitude, firm land, and free sea. And he also recognized that these imaginary lines carried real material effects, inaugurating uh, conceptions of space and time that ordered the earth legally, politically, and civilizationally. But he argued that Indians could actually use these global timelines to their advantage. So a unified time brought into existence by the world of the ship drew India and Canada into closer, um, dis into closer proximity. For Rahim, the spatial temporal order opened additional prospects for transoceanic mobility. So he says, to the residents of India, the North American continent is, <coughs> is on the antipode antipodes. When it is night in North America, it is morning in India. At every daybreak, India is one date ahead of America in the Chronicle of Time. So if a passenger traveled eastward, say from Calcutta, he would move across America from the Pacific to the Atlantic and then back to India. Yet if he moved westward, he would move across the Atlantic and cross America to the Pacific, a route that would also le uh, lead him to India. The global timelines that were inaugurated uh, by the movement of British ships that were calibrated from Greenwich and which placed Britain at the center of the world ensured the journey from east to west was shorter and more efficient than the European voyages from west to east. In changing the direction of seaborne travel, Rahim problematized the el elemental divisions between land, sea, east, west, gesturing to their colonial and racial origins. He also pointed to the fact that if passengers actually arrived on the Atlantic, that they would be able to take a train to the Pacific where many wanted to end up and gestured to the fact that land and sea were interconnected through these uh, very complex networks of uh, railways and uh, steamships. Envisioning himself on the decks of the Moana and docked in a, a busy Vancouver port, Rahim produced a counter nomos of the earth. He questioned the land sea distinction that was so central to Europe's conception of the free sea as introduced by Grotius from contests in the Indian Ocean and reinscribed in different ways by Schmidt in his periodization of the new world. In his narration, Rahim challenged these global lines as modernist and imperialist divisions that were naturalized as elemental and rendered foundational to international law. His cartography was informed, shaped, and animated by his own seaborne itineraries across the Indian and Pacific Oceans. While moving ships produced distinctions between firm land and free sea, the Santa Catarina and Columbus's vessels, moving anchored and detained ships undermined these elemental and juridical distinctions in important ways. So indeed, the territorial waters around the coastal regions raised questions about jurisdiction and about its fluidity. And for uh, Hussein Rahim, they produced new visions of the free sea as a locus of anti-colonial struggle. So I want to just very quickly conclude. So for indigenous and subaltern seafarers in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, the sea did not divide land or community. It connected them. Grotius's doctrine of the free sea, Samara Azmer argues, set a restraint on other imaginative historical political possibilities, and we might even say legal possibilities, of inhabiting the world and moving across its different surfaces horizontally and vertically without staging, without staging and capturing it. Indian migrants and radicals, including Hussein Rahim and Gurdit Singh, viewed the empire as a global vista in which land and sea featured as interconnected spaces to be traveled and traversed for commerce and adventure, and also as pathways to freedom. Keeping these histories in mind, I read Rahim's column in the Hindustani as a counter nomos, an order and orientation that was animated by anti-colonial imaginaries and that reclaimed the free sea by questioning the spatial, temporal, and juridical lines imposed on it. So 
Rahim's anti-colonial imaginary also has its own blind spots, as he imagined himself on the Moana and looking out to the shore to the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. This is what he would have seen, which is Stanley Park and is subject to three competing and overlapping land claims. He said little of their presence, their visions of land and sea, or their struggles of sovereignty against the Dominion of Canada. It was not until June 1914, in the last issue of the Hindustani, that he made any reference to Indigenous people, and this only through a letter that was sent to him by a so-called Canadian gentleman via the Komagatamaru's lawyer, Edward Byrd. So above this red line, it says the exclusion of Hindus, and above that is Canada as a Hindu saw it, which was the last installment of Rahim's um, Rahim's uh, column. So in this letter, which was titled The Exclusion of Hindus, um, this Canadian gentleman condemned the devastating conditions that confronted Indigenous people in Canada. He writes, we have never seen such a comprehensive, and this is Rahim introducing this letter. He says, we have never seen such a comprehensive and sound analysis of the Hindu question. It comes, as it comes from the pen of a Canadian gentleman, we take great pleasure in giving it room in these columns. And he goes on at the beginning of um, this latest issue saying that it's longer because there are all these additional uh, bits of writing. So the commentary was an antidote to the final installment of Rahim's own, Rahim's own chronicle, Canada as a Hindu saw it, where he failed to see indigenous people as perhaps preceding and inhabiting British and French, preceding uh, and inhabiting Canada uh, before the arrival of British and French settlers as sovereign nations. The article by the Canadian gentleman began somewhat predictably. It disputed prevailing claims that Indian migration posed racial threats to white labor. But the gentleman's commentary then took an unexpected turn. It questioned the legitimacy of Canada's identity as a white settler colony. So I quote, examined on its own merits, the doctrine that this is a white man's country cannot be defended, the author charged. We have successfully in almost, we have succeeded in almost exterminating the original occupants of our soil, but it is fair to contend that there is nothing really and inherently objectionable in people of one or two more distinct races living by side by side living side by side. In many ways, this was the culture of indigenous and, merit and Asian maritime worlds. People constantly moving across common spaces, coexisting with shared resources, and dependent on one another against the fury of the sea. Rahim's counter nomos of the earth reminds us that European conceptions of the free sea are not elemental or natural, but are ongoing products of colonial struggle and history. But as counter nomos also reminds us what is at stake in selectively remembering and forgetting struggles, whether over land or sea, solely in terms of Asia and at the expense of more robust imaginaries of the indigenous migrant solidarities that have long formed an alternative legal geography of the sea. Thank you. about trade, um, commerce, commodities, and your story is much more you know, about people, immigrants, etc. So I wanna know, do you see any shifts occurring in this history from commodities to people or commodities versus people? And you know, how would you um, describe these legal geographies or these new visions of the earth as you know, in one direction and the other? Thanks. So, um Okay, I'll talk into the mic. Um, so that's a really great question. Um, I guess in, so in other chapters in the book, I try to think about the question of legal personhood and how it is, how legal personhood is, you know, becomes a way of governing um, ships in foreign waters. But what I'm also interested in is the way and through various forms of abstraction and violence, how 
uh, people become commodities and objects, right, um, and uh, lose their personhood in, and I'm thinking, of course, of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, but I also, so that's sort of one answer to your question. And the other is that, you know, one of the interesting things about the Komagatamaru is that uh, the argument that's made is that, oh, you know, Gord the Singh was this, uh, all he was interested in doing was challenging Canadian immigration law and getting these um, passengers to Canada. And that is partly true, right? So he talks about going to the Hong Kong Gurdwara, seeing like this 150, these 150 men waiting for a steamship to take them, and some of them had been waiting there for years. But he also has a much grander aspiration, which is all about commerce. Um, and what he's interested in doing is creating this fleet of ships, uh, inaugurating the steamship company through the movement of this one ship in order to uh, create, like, uh, almost exclusively for commercial gain. Um, and the whole sort of, so even in the voyage of the Komagatamaru, he's looking for investors who will invest in his idea of um, a steamship company. He's unsuccessful in doing so for a vi variety of reasons. So I would really, um, ideally, I would like to see the two as interconnected, right? That, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, difficult to separate the movement of people from the uh, movement of commodities and commerce. And certainly, depending on who's moving those commodities, um, you know, the sea is open and closed. Thank you very much for your talk. I um, was curious about the haunting presence of the kind of paradigmatic sea. And in my mind, and in the mind of a lot of European thinkers, it's the Mediterranean. And the place that the Mediterranean has is this kind of model for what the sea is and the movement from sea to ocean. So, you know, Mediterranean studies is an industry, right? Yeah. So there's a whole group of people having this conversation in classics and antiquities and stuff like that, where you're able to have, you know, conceptual Mediterraneans and centers for Mediterranean studies. And so I'm wondering what ocean as method does that is different from that move, because um, it feels different. And, uh, you know, in, in obvious ways, not being Eurocentric, but uh, I'm just wondering if you could speak to the haunting presence of the Mediterranean. So the, so I, when I had started working on this, I was like, okay, it's going to be the Atlantic Pacific and Indian Oceans and that's it. Um, and then I, you know, so I was saying earlier today that I had these sort of bigger kind of theoretical ideas of what I wanted to do. And then when I started really immersing myself in the sort of specificity and the details, I'm like, oh my God, it's all here in the sort of movements of this, of this one vessel, right? And of course the, the ships start in the Mediterranean, right? So in German ports and then in the Mediterranean, uh, transporting settlers across the North Atlantic. Um, and, you know, I, and, and I actually end the book in the Mediterranean thinking about the sort of jurisdictional struggle in the epilogue, thinking about the jurisdictional struggles that are ongoing in the Mediterranean today and how in many ways the Komagatamaru, which started as this very exceptional voyage, has become very unexceptional, right? Because, you know, there are all of these sort of... Um, non-European men from North Africa who are tr trying to transport these um, people, you know, out of Syria and out of, um, you know, other places to the, uh, to European countries, right, to Italy, to, um, to Greece. And so, um, so, but I don't actually deal with the Mediterranean conceptually um, in the way that you're asking me. Um, and, and part of it is because I think that it, it, the book would have been never ending and also much longer and uh, more unwieldy than it already was. Um, but, but Oceans as Method is trying to think not only about um, not only about disparate or seemingly disparate geographies, but also about seemingly disparate histories, right? So one of the things that interests me is, you know, why, and this sort of animated my first book, which is why are we thinking about uh, the colonization of indigenous lands as separate from um, the forced movements of Asian migrants, particularly the Chinese. And I don't think it's enough, as many people do, to say, oh, well, I'll, you know, if you're not indigenous, then you're a settler. And you're, if, you know, 
like this used to be a very common practice in Canada um, and in Vancouver in particular where people would stand up and say, well, I'm an Asian settler and um, or I'm a, you know, South Asian settler. And I feel like that doesn't actually attend to these kind of overlapping histories in ways that I want them to. So part of it is thinking about um, geography. Part of it is thinking about history um, and just as it's uh, you know, trying to sort of move beyond kind of area studies model. It's also in some ways, like it jumps around, like this, what I talked about today is not at all what I ever imagined this book being about. Like I had to go way further back in history and I still feel like I have to go even further back um, to sort of capture the kinds of shifts and nuances that I'm um, trying to capture. Hi, um, thank you for this. This was very, very fascinating. Um, and maybe this question is a little, perhaps too tangential, but um, going reverse order from going f way back, but looking in a more contemporary context, um, I was wondering what, how, how, how we can understand, um, not understand um, movement beyond the sea and the land, but in open air. Um, you you spoke about thinking um, of these scholars in dialogue with Grotius and and Schmidt and Rahim, um, thinking about these these networks of steamships and and um, and railways. But um, today we see you know a lot lots of uh, human trafficking happening um, in airports and planes. And how do we lay claims to up there? Uh, thank you. Um, so, I mean, I think what's really interesting, interesting about air travel, and you saw this with the sort of multiple attempts to implement a Muslim ban, right, by the Trump government, is that, like, claims to, like, there are claims being made to airspace. And it doesn't matter whether people are, you know, landing in the United States or not, but there are, you know, it's like, well, you can't even fly over. Um, it doesn't matter uh, how many, you know, thousands of feet you are in the air, you can't even fly over because, um, you know, this is not allowed, right? So I think that there are really interesting uh, arguments to be made about how this, these forms of regulation are operating in different ways uh, through sort of legal claims to error. Um, and, uh, you know, I, people are making this argument. I'm thinking of uh, Karen Kaplan's work on aerial geographies and, and many other people. I like the the point you're making about air. So one of my co one of my colleagues says that oh your first book was on land and now you're working on sea and now you should do something on air. Um, but I'm but I'm actually interested in steam power, right? And um, and so uh, so not sort of thinking about aerial geographies, but really thinking about and problematizing and thinking more about steam as a technology. Thank you for a riveting talk. That was really, really engaging. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a couple of, I wanted to ask you more about uh, ocean as method, but from a methodological uh, standpoint, like what, you know, f tips for the unwary about how to engage in this kind of multi-archival work. And how, it's just a, if you have any thoughts about your process. And, and, and the second thing was about, um, it was, I was really, I mean, taken by the way you end or end with the indigenous, uh, indigenous of the ocean. And that was a bit of a, I mean, I also wondered how that came into to the narrative. And, or is that something that is sort of, is that a conceptual point that you end with? Um, so, okay, so uh, Oceans as Method is, um, partly guided by a sort of multi-sided archival research. Um, it's also conceptually guided by, um, so as I said earlier, the sort of limitations of 
um, area of an area studies approach, but also in imperial history, like some of the more um, sort of prominent metaphors have been like around webs, right? And so what does it mean to sort of move away from um, like one center? Um, so the, you know, the argument has been, okay, well, we can't focus on the metropole because there's lots of things happening in the colonies and we see this sort of movement back and forth. Um, and then, you know, Tony Ballantyne's really uh, wonderful metaphor of webs of empire, thinking about the sort of lateral relationships. And so, you know, I was thinking that currents actually, like they move with a certain kind of force and directionality, but they don't have, like there are multiple centers, right? And sort of multiple directionalities. And yet there's something still very uncertain and not, uh, you know, the, the sort of flows or the force can be, um, uh, powerful or not powerful, depending on what's happening, depending on the seasons, all these things. So I wanted to sort of uh, think about these indeterminacies and also to sort of problematize the linearity of, of the movements that we tend to think about and trace. Um, this took me 10 years. And, uh, you know, and, and part of it is like going to different places and doing archival research. And what really helped was to focus on one ship, right? Or one person or, um, because you can actually find lots of things in different places about, um, uh, about these individuals and shipping records have actually been really helpful because it's amazing. How, and I think part of it is because of the ungovernability of the sea that there's so much documentation around, you know, who was going where and which ships were going where. And so there are very, uh, very, um, sort of robust shipping records that you can use to think about movements both historically and in the more contemporary moment. Um, and so, okay, so, uh, so my first, so my, dis my PhD research really sort of started with uh, um, indigenous studies and, um, and, you know, I had planned to do this project looking at um, uh, indigenous settler relations on the West Coast. And then I was like, oh my God, why are the Chinese showing up everywhere? And you know, what remain, like what needs to be written there? Um, and so I feel like even though this was supposed to be a project on Indian migration, it's like I, it, it's there, right? And um, you know, thinking about uh, and this is definitely sort of a topic of discussion amongst um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous activists in various places in Canada, the US, Australia. Like what are the obligations that um, arrivants or newcomers have to thinking about like whose land this is and, and you know, what kinds of solidarities can be built around um, questions of land and, um, and kinship or community. And one of the, somebody, so uh, when Letty and I were in Australia, someone was saying to me, oh my God, I want to charter a ship and go and save the, you know, the detainees on Manus Island. Um, and in fact, indigenous activists are doing that, right? Like they, I don't know what actually happened to the ship, but they had, because that's not considered to be within the jurisdiction of Australia, they plan to go and, you know, save these detainees and give them passports to come to Australia. Um, so I think there's like a lot of really interesting activism happening. Like even the statement by, um, uh, I follow this, this activist group and, you know, the statement on what happened, the murder of 50 people in New Zealand and Christchurch at the mosques. Um, and, you know, the kind of solidarity that they showed with, um, you know, the families and communities and people around the world. And it really was a reminder that this is not new, right? That, and, you know, it's not even just saying, oh, that this Islamophobia and white nationalism has intensified sort of since 9-11 or since the election, since Trump's election, but no, it actually has a much longer history where, you know, countries like um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, Canada, the US have actually, um, committed genocide, right? And um, we need to, I think, remember those longer histories.